Okay, so I'll start um, the day with a um, short overview presentation, essentially, of the whole uh, feature set of the Immune Epidural Database, a little bit of historical uh, background of what we've been doing. And essentially, every part of what I'm presenting, there's going to be a more detailed uh, um, discussion later and more detailed presentation. So um, I'm not attempting to really explain everything in, in full, but kind of give the overall um, landscape. So what's the Immune Epidural Database? We always have to point out that it's a free resource, specifically at, 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 when we have booths at conferences. Um, obviously, this is because it's NIH funded. Uh, the goal is really to give um, experimentally derived information, make it freely available to the community. And in terms of scope, um, we are dealing with allergens, infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, and transplants, alloantigens. Uh, we do not specifically uh, curate cancer epitopes, um, although, as always, there's plenty of people who would like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, um, still, um, the, the IDB is still extremely useful for cancer epitopes because, I mean, the tools we're developing, we are curating this experimental information, and one of the things we are doing is uh, analyzing the experimental data to then analyze essentially the uh, can be derived generic rules that um, drive things like immunogenicity, and that can obviously then be applied to things like cancer epitopes just as well. Uh, we are dealing with both T cell and B cell epitopes. Uh, we also deal with um, things that are not strictly epitopes, so things like uh, MHC binding assays, MHC ligand dilution assays, because those are critical for uh, conditions for a peptide to be an epitope and to be recognized. So we deal with different uh, disease indications, with different assays, and different hosts. So essentially any host where an immune adaptive immune response is mounted uh, would be in the scope of the IEDB. At this point, uh, the, oh, there's over 17,000 papers curated in the IEDB, and there's also direct submissions where um, NIH-funded contracts submit data into the IIDB. And that has generated, at this point, 150,000 epitopes and close to a million assays. So <clears throat> when we started off, um, we, there were initial workshops and discussions on what should we actually include in the IIDB. And this does still come up. Somebody will say, well, this isn't really an epitope because it's not neutralizing or it's it's not a conformational epitope. It's, this is not real. So we are not trying, and this is going to change depending on who you talk to. So we are not trying to say this makes something a good epitope or a bad epitope, but uh, to characterize uh, what is it that people have actually found out about it. What is the assays that have been run with an epitope? And then we allow the user to query for characteristics of that assay to then get at the epitopes that they uh, care about. So essentially, therefore, Yes, the IEDB is a database of epitopes, but really it's a database of experiments in which epitopes are characterized. And in order to do that, we have to translate experiments as they are reported in the literature, in free text, in figures, in tables, in materials and methods sections, into a database uh, format, into a structured information format that then allows you to grasp all these very different kinds of uh, descriptions um, and, and query them in a way to, to get all the data that you want back. In order to do that, we had to do quite a lot of work, actually, in defining our data structure. And this is the, the high-level overview of uh, the kind of information we capture. So first of all, there needs to be the epitope, of course. And that could be something like a peptide. It could be discontinuous residues on a protein surface. It could be a non-peptidic molecule, like a carbohydrate. In order for us to know about the epitope, there must become some kind of information source. So as, as mentioned, the vast majority of data in the IDB comes from curated journal articles. But we also have data from author submissions. Typically, an epitope will be part of something else. It's studied because a given peptide, say, is part of an organism, like a virus or bacteria, and is part of a certain protein. Or uh, specifically for, for, for antibodies, you can have, obviously, an epitope spread across uh, multiple proteins, which binds the uh, interjection, interjunction of, of a protein complex. So that's the source of the epitope that we're curating. And then, uh, in order for it to be experimentally characterized, somebody must have run an assay on it. So somebody must have measured a B cell response or T cell response uh, against an epitope. Or as mentioned, we also deal with uh, simple MHC binding or MHC ligand dilution assays. Uh, in the case of B cell or T cell responses, uh, the cells used in the assay are just as important as the epitope itself. So the, typically, there's some kind of immunization process preceding the actual assay. The immunization could be something like an actual, um, oops, an actual vaccination. Um, 
in which um, a human or an animal model or whatever is injected with an immunogen and then you take the B cells or T cells and test them in the assay or you have uh, hosts, often in human studies, um, you have things like uh, uh, donors that are known to just come out of the hospital and having had a certain infection and you study those or you have things like um, say if you characterize influenza epitopes, typically uh, people just enroll adults and you assume that there was uh, a previous infection with influenza uh, without necessarily documenting uh, the, the specific infection um, in that individual. So for each of these things, we've been collaborating with outside knowledge resources, and these are just mentioning a few, to say uh, when we characterize proteins, we use uniprot identifiers, etc. Um, obviously, when we carry something like journey articles, we use uh, the NCBI, um, and so on. And that actually enables us, um, that's the, one of the goals that we have, actually to integrate the kind of data that we are uh, capturing here about immune epitopes with other kind of knowledge resources out there. This is an overview of the curation process, so, uh, or progress. Uh, when we started in 2004, there were 13,000 papers that dealt with epitopes. And as you see, we have managed to uh, deplete that and have pretty much caught up on the backlog and now are, uh, have actually 17,000 something papers curated in the IADB. Obviously, this is more because there's a constant influx of papers. And so here in 2010 was our renewal. And because we were done, as we had said, and I age said, now we can cut your money by two thirds because you <laughs> have <laughs> done the backlog. And, and this is good. I mean, we it, it, do consider it a success that we actually did manage to capture up. So every, if you find a paper that deals with epitopes that we don't have in the database, uh, please let us know. So obviously there's still things that, individual things that trickle in that we're missing. Uh, we can't be perfect, but ultimately everything that's um, out there should be in the IADB. And our current goal is to actually within a matter of something like eight weeks from publication, the data should be in the IADB. So that was really the focus of the first, uh, uh, the first contract period. We wanted to get all the data in. And then we had all the data in. And then people said, well, the IDB is great and all, but you're giving me like tables of thousands of epitopes and, and I can't really deal with it. So the, the focus really of, of the next uh, few years was this IDB 3.0 redesign where we uh, tried to make the query interface and getting at information from the IDB easier. So um, also the kind of interfaces we had were trying to enable everything for everyone which meant obviously that they were too complicated to make anything easy. So we've refocused and tried to make um, the, the interfaces as, as easily usable as possible. And I'll show some of this later. And that was really driven by uh, the feedback that we got from workshops like these or at booths or in general people contacting us. So really the, the feedback that we're getting uh, is, is crucial. Because obviously if you're sitting by yourself in, in your little desk and think this is what users want and then they, they, they typically don't. It's better to actually <laughs> Here. So this is the new um, IEDB homepage and um, here on the right hand side is the access towards the tools and that's going to be the subject tomorrow. Today it's much more about this, querying the IEDB uh, and searching for data and essentially the new paradigm in the search is okay you have immediately on the homepage the majority of searches that people do and we know that from the query logs. Um, 80% uh, or something like that of all queries should be possible to just run on the homepage interface. And um, then once you get to this uh, results, you can do additional filters. So here, for example, is filtered based on felp one which is a Timothy grass allergen and responses in humans. And then you're getting your lists of epitopes back. And again, this is going to be going into much more detail uh, in the uh, next talk. Uh, in addition to working on the query interface, we also dealt quite a bit on making the kinds of information uh, and, and, and uh, the, the, the knowledge representation in the IDB easier to understand. So here's an example of um, uh, what we did. Namely, we had the NCBI taxonomy as our classification scheme of organisms. And I don't know who's ever tried from the NCBI taxonomy side. It's a, it's a fun exercise. If you go to the root node and try to navigate towards finding humans, it's 36 clicks down the way, diff uh, different taxonomic classifications, and I, I challenge anyone to succeed in that. It's, it's essentially impossible. 
And, but it's also, that's because the NCBI taxonomy wasn't meant for that. They have to deal with every organism ever made. Um, and they are dealing with, uh, uh, yeah, distinctions between organisms, organism families, that specifically if you're dealing in immunology, we don't necessarily care that much about. So we actually provided a trimmed version of the NCBI tree and did some uh, asked users, uh, like essentially is uh, homo sapiens a vertebrate, questions like that, and uh, we could get a much higher uh, correct classification rate here doing this kinds of work. This is just an example of essentially we are trying to continuously improve the underlying vocabularies that we use to represent knowledge in the IADB uh, to improve access to the data. This is another thing. As I showed you this, this data with the lists of uh, epitopes and Timothy grass, many of these epitopes are small variants of each other. So somebody makes a 10 mer peptide, the next person makes an 11 mer peptide, and somebody uses a different isoform. And, and that leads to these huge lists of epitopes that are in frequently actually pretty much the same. So here in this case, you have, um, what, what, what we did is we map the information back uh, to the protein sequence and then provide an overall degree of immunogenicity as a position in the protein. And you can see in this case, you have uh, uh, essentially the, the majority of immune recognition here is, is targeted towards an uh, a 40 residue area within the, in this protein where really the majority of the recognition is. So again, this is like an ag uh, uh, aggregation of uh, data to get away from reporting individual experiments and reporting instead uh, summaries. Sometimes data in the IEDB changes. So if you, uh, and it should. And that is because we are going in and recurating. So as we are curating uh, data into the IEDB, uh, rules change uh, because you come across a problem that you didn't anticipate before uh, and then later you might say, okay, I really want to distinguish between these different two different types of, of cytokines or of uh, measurements made. And then we want to go back and recurate this data. So uh, that's in order to essentially take, uh, take into account uh, improvements in science and also um, in, in some cases we are running, uh, we are finding that th certain things are unclear in the database we add automated validation rules that then check for potential errors. Uh, this is very similar to like software testing and we go in, those errors are then flagged and we go in and, and, and fix them. Um, the goal here then of these changes is to over time improve the accuracy and consistency of the data. And um, yeah, I think, I mean, we are recreating maybe along the lines of one to 5% per year, yes. So what do you do in the case where the information reported by scientists is inconsistent or otherwise so nuanced that it, you don't know what the accuracy is of, of the experiments? Or right. So um, there are certain things that we are insisting on that, that must be present in the paper. If, if they don't, we don't find them in the paper, we'll actually email the author and uh, try to get that information. And if the author doesn't respond, and, and, uh, well, they, then we ultimately are not going to put the paper in. Uh, in, in general, the one thing, also the other thing, that would be one example of us not putting something in. The other example would be if there's direct conflicts in the paper. So it says X uh, and, uh, in one part of the paper and Y in the other. That also we would not put in. So, um, but um, that's pretty much it. And obviously that it has all the same problems as everything in the published literature. There's always going to be things that are wrong that are published, but we're not trying to judge that beyond. We're reporting essentially what's written, if we can. Um, yes, so there's, uh, I talk mainly about the papers, but there is a large amount of data coming from the submission community. And th those submissions are um, typically uh, NIH-funded epitope discovery contracts. Right now there's 10 of those that deal with infectious diseases, and so half of them are focused on B-cell epitopes, half on T-cell epitopes. And these are the current 10. There have been 24 previous ones, and they're all pretty uh, substantially funded contracts, and that has also then explains why uh, such relatively few uh, uh, sources of submission actually led to 76,000 epitopes that are in the IADB, and roughly uh, close to 20% of the epitopes in the IADB uh, come from these contracts. There is the ability to deposit data in the IADB on a case-by-case -case basis, so people can contact us, and then we typically pass it by Joe in this case, and uh, uh, he will say yes or no, this is in scope or not. We aren't, if there would be a massive influx of data, we would have a problem. Um, but uh, so far, it, it's, it tends to be um, manageable. 
Um, another thing we are doing in order to make the data more visible in the IADB and to get feedback from the community is meta-analysis. So typically if a subject is done, if we've thinking we've curated all uh, epitopes from say influenza, um, then we're trying to summarize what is the overall uh, data that we have generated, what we have learned, uh, and then actually pass that by experts and say, hey, hey here, this is um, um, what we think is, is known about uh, epitopes. That was actually, in influenza, that was one of the most fun exercises where um, the, the first analysis we did in 2007, um, we published this and said there's actually no human epitope known in influenza, no human B cell epitope known in influenza. And people are saying, no, 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 there is plenty. And then nobody could show us one, <laughs> which is really fun. That has obviously drastically changed. Uh, there's plenty of uh, B cell epitopes in, in um, humans out now. Um, so the goal here is then again to get feedback from the community. Also, have we done this accurately? Have we missed data? And are our conclusions right? Uh, and there, typically from these meta-analysis, we learn how to make things better again and then uh, update the data in the IDB. Uh, another thing we are doing is promoting the IDB data. So right now you're sitting in uh, the annual user workshop. Uh, this is our what? Fourth? Or fourth, okay. Um, and uh, if you find it very useful, uh, we also go to the exhibit booths. Um, that's the one where we always have to say free, free, free because people think we're selling them something. Uh, we are performing meta-analysis at least one per year and then uh, publishing papers. Publishing papers is one of the easiest way to, for people to notice you. And then we have a bunch of outreach in terms of just improving our help as well. So as Ward has mentioned, uh, we really have uh, two goals to this workshop. And and we are self-centric, so our goal is really uh, that we want to learn from you, and, and that's, this is really not, uh, um, uh, this is really true. So it is extremely useful for us to observe how people are using the database and what the problems are, what are the missing features, what, what, is, what is problematic, where we think this is trivial. Um, so for us, you're, you're a captive audience now, so we'll uh, try to pick your brains and, and learn from you. Uh, and that is really what is driving uh, what are the next steps, uh, what, what we do want to add to the IDB and improve. But also, obviously, we want to enable you. Uh, and again, this is completely selfish. Our metrics of success is how many papers come out that cite the IDB. That's kind of thing. We want really, uh, for our success is going to be if other people get enabled by the IDB. That's what we are funding for. That, that's, that helps us. So uh, if you can out of, get out of here and uh, ultimately can publish a paper inside the IDB, then we are extremely happy. That's our best outcome. So that's my final slide. Um, just as a reminder, the IDB da database deals with experimental data. And those experimental data are ex made accessible through the IDB database. And that's primarily what we're talking to about, about today. But also, the same data is utilized to derive general rules that then make it into the analysis tools uh, on, on, on the analysis resource page. So essentially, the, these two go hands in hand. And the ability to predict uh, is really driven by uh, knowing um, examples of things that are uh, true. And with that, I'm 